evenings, everyone. Uh, I'm Gail Lapidus. I'm a senior fellow at the Center for International Security and Cooperation, uh, also working in the field of Russian and former Soviet studies. And it's my honor and pleasure today uh, to introduce Lena Johnson. Uh, she is the Associate Professor of Political Science and a research fellow at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, um, where I first met her some many years ago when she organized the conference on the war in Chechnya, in case some of you still remember those events as well. Uh, until July 2015, she headed up the Russia program at the Institute, and she has a very interesting career trajectory. Uh, back in uh, 2002, she worked um, as political officer in, uh, in um, Dushanbe, in Tajikistan. Uh, she worked as a political officer at OSCE. Uh, she's also worked as, um, as a counselor of the Swedish consulate in Moscow. And her latest books, which you're going to hear about, the most recent one, on art and protest in Putin's Russia, <coughs> is just the latest in a long series of publications that include uh, the titles Waiting for Reform under Putin and Medvedev, Tajikistan in the New Central Asia, Putin and Central Asia, and other questions. Um, her current research focuses on Russian domestic politics, political and societal change, and the role of culture and the arts in these processes. So please join me in welcoming Lena to Stanford. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad to be here, and I'm very glad for this invitation to, to uh, and the possibility to, um, to, to present my book. Um, um, this book about art and protest in Putin's Russia. Well, this is a book about uh, in uh, this is this this is a book about art and protest in Russia um, in the years from 2000 up to the spring of 2014, with a special focus on the years of 2005. And it's a book about Russian contemporary art, and it gives an overview of the art scene and its development during these years. But it's not a traditional art book. Uh, I'm not an art historian, I'm a political scientist, and what I find um, of interest first and foremost is art in its social context. And I'm most interested in the way protest develops and social movement appear. Uh, so the book can also be read as a chronicle of the changes in Russian society during these years. And it shows how different uh, tendencies arose and developed in parallel, those that resulted in the mass uh, demonstrations of late uh, 2011 and early 2012, but also those that ended in victory uh, for an author authoritarian conservative backlash in May 2012, when Putin was returned to power. And a major issue in the book is the role of art in society, and thus the relationship between art and power and art and politics. And my presentation will focus on how I handle this tricky issue. Uh, and uh, during our discussion, we can focus more on the current political situation and what it means for cultural life. Uh, I start with the reference I make in the concluding chapter uh, to the American scholar Frank C. Scott and his study domination and the arts of resistance, hidden transcripts. And Scott, he makes a distinction between the public transcript, which he describes as the open interaction between subordinated people and those who decide what can be said in public, and the hidden transcript, which is a discourse that takes place off stage, beyond the control of the elite. And he says that in the public transcript, a circumspect and almost invisible struggle is waged daily by subordinate groups trying to invade the public transcript with hidden messages or with hidden references to, to resistance. And he, he, he says that at an early stage, 
he compares this struggle um, to infrared rays beyond the visible end of the spectrum. And then at a later stage, um, it can be compared to a water that gradually fills a dam, pressing on the walls, slowly finding its way through the barriers until it breaks through and the dam bursts under the weight. And at a certain point, there will be a rupture in the public cordon sanitaire as the previously hidden transcript in resistance burst out openly in the public transcript. And I believe that Scott's words, they, um, they capture what I've been trying to do in my book. Um, because in a way, my book is about how the water was filling up to the brim, starting to burst over into the public transcript. But instead of breaking the dam, the dam was rapidly reinforced, and the water, at least temporarily, <coughs> contained. Well, why culture? Why do I write my culture on why art? Well, studies of authoritarian countries have shown that culture often becomes an arena for the exchange of ideas and critical discourses when free public political debate is not permitted. But why contemporary art? Well, except that I'm interested in that. Um, I'll, well, I worked in Moscow as the culture councillor of the Switzerland embassy from 2005 and to the very end of 2009. And, and at the time I arrived, the art scene had just exploded. New galleries were, also, were, were opening. Uh, former factories and industrial sites were being converted into areas for contemporary art, and lots of interesting exhibitions were taking place. And the art scene remained relatively free, in spite of the fact that political freedoms, freedom uh, were circums was circumscribed in society. And my years in Moscow gave me an opportunity to closely follow the art scene, visit all the most interesting exhibitions, and meet many people. And I got the feeling that what was happening on the art scene, it had relevance beyond the galleries. And I felt that something was going on, although I couldn't put my finger on it. And well, it turned out that I was right. And the book covers a period when society was undergoing dramatic twists and turns. And the political system developed from being semi-authoritarian to more or less fully authoritarian. And looking back, I mean, these years, um, 2005 to 2009, when I was there, can be described as the golden years, especially the 2005 to 2008. Um, when Russian revenues for energy exports were high, the general standard of living was increasing, and although the political system was becoming more and more authoritarian and social differences drastically increased, few people showed an active interest in politics during, well, um, well during the first decade of the 2000s. Um, and Russian society can best be described by the term depolitization. People, they despised politics and everything political, regardless of whether it was an official pro-regime politics or anti-regime uh, one. Uh, to them, the private sphere was everything. Well, uh, interest in art, uh, interest in political affairs uh, would well, drastically increase during the following years. And the mass protest of, this, of December 2011 came as a peak of, this, of that interest. Well, I, I formulated my um, two major research, research questions as follows. First, how come that about 100,000 people took to the streets of Moscow um, in December 2011, in a country where protest demonstrations even in Moscow normally gathered 3,000 people at the most. Um, a value shift had obviously taken place. And there are studies from other countries uh, were that, which show that a value shift usually takes place before social appearance. Uh, 
and the culture is a receptive sphere where well, picking up moods and, and ideas. So had art played such a role in Russia? Well, what, what role did art play in this process? And, and second, what happened to art and protest uh, after May 2012 when Putin returned as president and brought with him an ultra-conservative ideological political agenda? So, how did I deal with these questions? Well, I'm not in favor of grand theories, but I was searching for theoretical concepts uh, that could help me with um, the analysis. And the works of three scholars in, in, inspired me the most. Uh, first of all, Jacques Rancière, the French philosopher, and then also Sigmund Bauman, the Polish sociologist, and Hank Johnston, the American scholar. But first, Rancière. I needed concepts that would cover protest in art, uh, from subtle forms to more open and direct forms, and in politics, in the form of political action and protest. And I searched for a common denominator, but I wanted one that would prevent me from simplifying or overinterpreting what I saw, read, and heard. And I use a wide definition of protest. And inspired by Rancière, I define protest as the question of the established and dominant perspectives and perceptions of the prevailing order of power. Sorry. Well, Rancière, he talks about the distribution of the sensible, by which he means configurations of the sensory landscape, of what is seen and unseen, audible and inaudible, how certain objects and phenomena are related, and also who can appear as the subject at certain times and places. And the distribution of the sensible is usually shared by society. <coughs> it defines how we understand the world around us, and thus determines what is considered possible and what can be expected. And he calls this distribution of the sensible consensus. And dissensus is the questioning of the established view. So using the latter concept, I was able to formulate three categories of dissensus in art, which differed with regard to how open or direct the dissensus was, was, but I will come back to this. And now, according to Rancière, dissensus in politics takes the form of subjectivation, which he names the process when people whose voices normally do not come, who are not listened to, raise their voices, while in art it takes the form of aesthetic rupture. But in spite of these differences between art and politics, the core of the census is the same. The questioning of the established and prevailing ways of understanding the world. Okay, but the census in relation to what? And here Sigmund Bauman enters the scene for me. Because he talks about identity as a social construction and how important it is for the authorities to create um, an identity among the citizens that helps to strengthen the state and its cohesion and give legitimacy to the authorities in the eyes of, of, uh, of uh, the state citizens. And over the years, Putin has been trying hard to create quality we, the Russians. So what I did first of all was to reconstruct the official view that was developing with regard to Russian identity which means the way Putin tried to create a collective identity, a collective we, that included positions with regard to state nationalism. And I then define it as the way you look at the past, the present, and the future, to the role of religion in society, um, to the way the, the other was understood, and the way symbols of state power and state leader were presented. 
So I started to search for signs of the census in art. And I searched among artworks at, um, at key exhibitions in the Moscow, Moscow contemporary scene, uh, art scene. I mean, uh, people uh, may come from other parts of, of Russia, but they end up in, 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 in Moscow. Uh, I, uh, it means that uh, there are other non-Moscow Moscovites um, also among the artists, and, it's, and sometimes I make exceptions and, and also include um, people who have not have been uh, exhibited in, in Moscow, but that are the exceptions. And I looked for uh, artworks which deviated from the official consensus through the, the way they <coughs> presented as I said, the past, present, the future, religion, the other, and symbols of state and the in power and the head of state. Well, here it becomes important whose eye determines whether one can talk about the census in art or not. And I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, the objective uh, judge in this regard. And I want to quote the art critic Claire Bishop's words that Franciere is important as his reworking of the term aesthetics concerned aesthetics. She says, rather than considering the work of art to be autonomous, he draws attention to the autonomy of our experience in relation to art. And this freedom suggests a possibility of politics and stood here as dissensus, because the undecidability of aesthetic experience implies a questioning of how the world is organized and therefore the possibility of changing or redistributing this same, that same world. Well, in other words, what Rancière does is to emphasize the role of the spect spectator in the interpretation of the artwork. And I was interested in the Rus Russian reception. So when interpreting works of art, I was guided by the Russian text. What the artist said, as well as the curators, art critics, and or angry citizens, uh, what they said about these artworks. And I was interested in, in whether uh, signs of the census in, in art uh, indicated that there were other ways of understanding we, the Russians, and I was also interested in whether there was a dynamic, whether a counterculture was developing uh, within the art scene, uh, within the, the sphere of contemporary art. And here, Hank Johnston and his studies of new social movements and the role of culture and cultural factors in their development becomes of interest to me. And, and inspired by him, I not only picked pieces of art interpreted the ideational content, but also I analyzed how the art community reacted in words and deeds when conflicts and scandals developed around art. And that means that I, I also examined how the art community, or at least parts of it, reacted in situations when artists were under attack or criticized, criticized by the church, um, the authorities, the state authorities, or groups in society. Now, I wanted to know if a counterculture was evolving within the art sphere, <clears throat> in the sense that people started to understand we in a different way to the officially formulated we, uh, and if they started to make a distinction between we and those in power. So, what did I find? Well, I found, first of all, <clears throat> that art did play a role in the process of value change during these years, preceding the mass demonstrations, but not in any, any direct way, and not by propagating any political vision or message, because this was not political art in the way we usually understand it in the West. Instead, art had a mind-liberating function, and, and I identified three distinct aspects of this mind-liberating function. And 
and the first by questioning uh, the official consensus. And, and as I have already mentioned, I make a distinction between three categories of art of the census according to the degree and intensity of the census. And the, and the, and the, um, the, and the first category, category is the sub subtle form which I call an other glance, uh, meaning other in relation to the official uh, consensus of collective identity formation. Well, art is ambiguous and leaves itself open to various interpretations, and so does this kind of art in particular. And although it carries no hidden messages, it adds new dimensions and complicates official discourses. These artists, they, I want to emphasize, they do not make political statements, but their art may still be interpreted in a political way, because the interpretation lies in the eyes of the beholder. And I'll show you uh, some examples. And they, these works, they uh, can be related to what I call an image of the present. And these, uh, these works, they fall in line more with the, with the uh, perspective and arguing of Sigmund Bauman when he talks about uh, liquid society where people feel insecurity, uh, uncertainty and fear rather than with the official Russian discourse of the more optimistic view of society as stable and normal. And I, the first one is Alexander Brodsky. And in his works, he always is uh, uh, expressing the fragility and vulnerability of cities, uh, cities buildings, and human <coughs> beings. And this is the penultimate day of Pompeii. This one is the cell, and it opens uh, to the sky of nothing, and down uh, it opens to a dark uh, nothing. Um, and, and it's, uh, well, like the life on, on the edge, um, where these different functions of, of the room is connected with, on the walls uh, with uh, these ladders. This is a uh, uh, soup or the blue soup. Uh, this is a poem from a, a video about one hour called The Lake. And it's nothing is really happening there. It, it's only, uh, you see this lake when the, and the, the forest around, and it, uh, it empties, and, and then it fills up again. And uh, the, the night comes, it gets dark, and then light returns. And this takes place slowly during this hour. And you, you are just standing there, fascinating, because there, there, is this, uh, there is this feeling that there is something, a hidden threat lurking somewhere, and, and, but you, can't, you do, not, do not know what it is. Well, most of the videos uh, uh, express the same feeling. I rapidly show that you have Andre Kuskin uh, along with the serpent who are walking in, in concrete. Um, yeah, that's a performance. Irina Korna um, and Chaim uh, Sokol, for example. Um, the second category um, of, of dissensus in an art I call dissent art. And it more openly challenges the official consensus with the help of the respectless laughter, irony, parody, often in the form of provocation, and often in the tradition of medieval carnival culture. And this sort has no direct political message. It may mock the authorities, but there is no uh, political message. I, I have included um, this work in this section, <coughs> although it's in the, in the first section in the book. But it's by um, a Petersburg artist, Sofia Asarkin. And it's called uh, The Future of uh, Russia, uh, the coronation, Monarchy, the Coronation of the President, the Tsar. And it's from 2004. And is she mocking for Putin? Or is she praising him? I mean, it's hard to tell. 
she has, I mean, you have, you have the, the, the hats on top of, um, of, uh, of Putin, and you have the monomach, which is the symbol of the autocracy. Uh, and uh, that is the ordinary panegyrical style. And uh, the artist said that she's one of these sheep uh, at, the, at the foot of Putin. Um, but the, the cultural committee of uh, Petersburg <coughs> looked upon it in a different way uh, in 2004. And um, they um, <coughs> took away from, from, an, uh, in a, from the ex exhibition. Um, but then yes, it has been shown uh, later at the exhibitions. This one, <coughs> um, this is uh, the Sinina Sea, the Blue Noses. I mean, does it have a political message? Hardly. You have a respectless laughter. But that's it. But it's a kind of desacralization of power which takes place. You have this one, it's also by the Sin Nasi in the era, era of mercy. Uh, it's an uh, homage to uh, Banksy who made the graffiti of two poppies kissing each other. But, I mean, it's harmless, you may think, but it caused a scandal in 2007 when the then culture minister wanted to prevent it from being exhibited in Paris because he considered it was, uh, it was a harm to Russia, Russian interest and scam. Um, but you can, and you can, um, well, I show you this first. You can also include uh, art uh, activism, art actions in this category. And here is something uh, called Monstratze. It started in 2004 in uh, Novosibirsk and has been going on once a year, the 1st of May, every year since then has also spread to other uh, cities. And it's not a demonstration, it's a kind of carnival. And all the slogans are complete nonsense. Well, this big banner, well, it does have a deeper meaning because it says forward to the dark past. And I mean, it has a lot of uh, meaning today. But, but the rest, normally, it, it means nothing. And, and, uh, uh, and I, well, I can tell that uh, this was um, awarded an art prize um, one of the most two, uh, most prestigious art prizes in Russia. You have um, well, you have this one. Uh, this is um, a group Vaina uh, with people from Moscow and Petersburg. Uh, they started with uh, actions in 2007, and uh, and uh, they never explained the, the the actions. And in this. I mean, this is an oil painting of, a, of a, a picture from the internet. Uh, but what they did was that they took this glass, uh, glass light cannon to, to a building, well, opposite, well, fairly far away from the White House, from, from, uh, from the government building. And then they, well, managed to get this picture on the wall, probably only for a few seconds. Well, maybe as much as one minute, but um, it was enough to have it on film and then to have it on the internet, as they film all the uh, film all the actions and all preparations and everything. Um, but the the third category is what I call the art of engagement, and in contrast to the other two categories. They carry a, a direct political message. For example, Pussy Riot, and you have one of their actions here on the Red Square. You also have this uh, action in the cathedral um, of Christ the Savior in central Moscow. And, and they had, well, plain political texts. Uh, I mean, their actions are in, in an artistic form, but they have a clear political message. Like in the cathedral, when they were uh, pleading, praying to, to uh, Virgin Mary, 
uh, for help to drive Putin away. And there are other groups of this kind, for example, the Pittsburgh group, Stordielat, uh, what is to be done, uh, who works um, um, in, with this, uh, how to open political form of, of art. <coughs> so there, there was an increasing interest in this kind of art during the years I'm studying. Um, the second form of the mind liberating function of art um, during these years was when art put its finger on vulnerable spots in society and open conflicts arose as a result. And these conflicts, they indicated that official policy was changing and in what direction. What previously had not provoked, now did. Uh, and the two exhibitions in the, during the 2000s, Beware Religion from, and Forbidden Art, they all can be seen as examples. Um, some of the, the exhibited works, they were, belonged to the Soviet underground, and they, the artist had used religious symbol in a way for criticizing Soviet ideology. And and um, now, more than 30 years later, this was, well, uh, interpreted in a completely different context by some people. And the organizers there of the exhibition were taken to court and found guilty of offending the feelings of believers. And the, the verdicts, they revealed these close ties between the senior leadership of the church and the state. Uh, and that the church was now given the privilege of deciding what kind of art was allowed to be exhibited in public spaces. And I give you an example of the absurdities of this kind of criticism. And this is not from these exhibitions, this is a later work installation, and it's called uh, Blue Cities. And well, the background is a different work, you shouldn't pay attention to that. But it's called Blue Sits uh, by Tanya Antonshina. And I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it, give, it gives them, them an impression of uh, church couples. Uh, and in this, uh, um, you get this uh, effect by very simple means, by these glass bottles and this rubber thing that you buy in the pharmacy. I don't really know the exact word for it, but it's used for it very precise purposes. And, uh, and, and, um, and that was probably the point why the representatives from the church and orthodox patriotic groups uh, of the right, why they got so upset um, and, and thought that this was offending the, the, the believers. But the, this uh, legal uh, process against the Forbidden Art, art Exhibition, it helped to create a counterculture within the subculture of art. But the third form of the mind liberating function was when art actions became a substitute for political actions. And there were a couple of um, spectac spectacular art actions taking place between 2007 and 2012. And they were interpreted as political acts at a time when ordinary channel for political criticism was closed, were closed. And I want to show you the action by the group uh, by now. Uh, this is also an oil painting of the, of the action. And, and um, they painted a phallus on a bridge in St. Petersburg, um, one of the main bridges, just before the bridge was raised. Uh, for the night traffic on the river, and thereby also raising the fellows. And you may think, so what? Uh, but in the Russian context, this had a special, uh, got a special meaning. And although Vaina never explains in words their actions, um, this action took place almost opposite the building uh, that housed the headquarters of the FSB, the, the city police. <coughs> security police in Pittsburgh. And uh, a, a video of the action spread uh, widely across the internet, and people laughed. Well, why did they laugh? Uh, I mean, you, of course, you can interpret it a bit differently. You can, you can um, interpret it as um, um, 
a gesture of fuck you to the authorities, you can also interpret it as a kind of gesture of, um, of a much kind, which also the, uh, the FSB would uh, appreciate. However, it was the first uh, interpretation was that was the widespread, most widespread one, and it was also this interpretation that made it nominated to one of the two most prestigious uh, uh, prizes for uh, contemporary art, and, and it was awarded the, the, the project of the year uh, in April 2011, and that was also a sign of that discussion going on in, in the art community. And then the first signs of open protest of art uh, took place when individuals, primarily from the cultural sphere, started to raise their voices. There were rock musicians, poets, architects, and, and journalists. And as acts of political protest, I analyzed the media activism on the internet before the parliamentary elections in December 2011 and the presidential elections of March 2012 and then the mass demonstrations that followed. And this protest was a moral political uh, uh, protest, first of all. <clears throat> but they became the peak of a process of subjectivation in the political field, as people now raise their voices. Well, how to understand the role played by the art in the process of subjectivation? And, well, of course, art did not cause the demonstrations. Um, a complex set of the social and political factors helped to explain why discontent arose in society at this specific time. Um, the, the appearance of counterculture in art was part of a larger shift of mood and values in society, and it developed in parallel with the appearance of a counterculture in politics. But it is my claim that dissensus in art preceded dissensus in politics. And contemporary art visualized something that had not been articulated in political terms and was a kind of premonition that something was on its way in society. Art is sensitive, easily picks up, changes the mood, and uh, by offering other perspectives, angles, approaches, and ways of seeing, contemporary art became a free space for the exchange of ideas. And the fact that contemporary art was regarded as trendy, hip, innovative, and attracted intellectuals, um, the creative class and parts of the middle class, made it a channel for communication between groups that would later be key groups in political protest. Um, but I want to emphasize again that in discussing the relationship between the arts and political protest, we mustn't think in direct terms. Just as the interpretation of an artwork lies in the eyes of the beholder and not as imminent of that piece of art, it is the effect of art, the social life of the artwork that is important in the sense of its interplay with the social and political context. Okay, what happened after May 2012? Well, in in May 2012, official, poli official policy definitely changed as Putin returned to the presidency. And this is, um, this is different from, um, from the previous years. Um, and, um, these, uh, the components of this agenda well, it reminds not only of the Russian and Soviet past, but, but also the components from radical conservative ideas in the Europe of the 1930s. We, we can, can come back to that in the discussion. But I mean, the pillars are authoritarianism, orthodoxy, and, and patriotism. And, and from May 2012, political repression put an end to the protest movement. And conflicts around art exhibitions intensified during, during 2012. And the new state policy was immediately felt in the culture sphere. The, the new uh, Minister of Culture, Medinsky, uh, he was uh, well known for his conservative and patriotic views. And he started immediately uh, to, to, do, to transform uh, policy and, and, uh, and cultural life. 
and the, the guidelines for state cultural policy presented in 2014 and, and signed by Putin in December that year reflected an, an utmost conservative view on culture <coughs> according to which culture was to become the major instrument for spreading and strengthening the new state ideology of patriotic, religious, and anti-liberal values, and which were now considered the value matrix of the unique Russian civilization. And I mean, we can come back in the discussion what is included in in in, uh, in this uh, in this agenda. But our protest continued under the new political conditions which can be seen, for example, in the uh, exhibitions of uh, nominated uh, works uh, for, the, uh, for, for the art prior, prior prices. Uh, but open protest in art became rare, and protest in art became, since then, much more subtle. And, and keywords uh, in the conservative offensive against the arts became offending the, the feelings of believers and offending traditional Russian conservative values. And I mean, you, you should not just take these words for the, uh, as, as they stand, but you have to look um, on them in the, the way they are interpreted uh, and in the specific Russian context. And the Russian annexation of Crimea in the spring 2014 and the war in Ukraine, they further hate them in the political climate in the country. And, and the, the hunt for the internal enemy and the fifth column uh, give the conflicts around the arts an extra dimension of being unpatriotic. So when I finished the book in spring 2014, I understood that the epoch of what, what say post-reform political vacillations that had started in late 1990s and, and had definitely come to an end. And in the new authoritarian conservative Russia, uh, the field of culture is regarded by the government as a battlefield of world views, and culture therefore uh, become the target of the, an offensive. And to the authorities, the church and to various extreme religious and patriotic groups, Gaining control of what is to be seen, heard, and read in the field of culture is to be a top priority of the state. So conflicts around art, the arts have continued. But since late 2014, there are theatre productions that are more often uh, the, the target of attacks than art exhibitions. And, when, and, and moreover, when talking about <coughs> criticism, uh, 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 criticism against the uh, um, theatre plays. I mean, I'm not uh, talking about uh, <coughs> contemporary radical plays painting Russian society in dark colours, but productions of classical Russian and foreign texts that are criticised. Recently, I mean, the the, the production of uh, Wagner's opera Tannhäuser in Novosibirsk caused a great scandal. Um, <coughs> and um, uh, which resulted in the in the theatre uh, director being fired, and um, and the plays by based on text by Dostoevsky and Pushkin and staged by famous Russian theatre directors as Konstantin Bagamolov and Kirill Serebrenikov have been well criticised. And with regard to <coughs> scandals around uh, art ex exhibitions, in August this year, works by uh, famous Russian non-conformist artists of the 50s and 60s, among them Vadim Sidur, were, and it was his works that were vandalized at the uh, uh, exhibition, uh, the Manej, uh, in central Moscow, um, by Orthodox fanatics. And, and um, um, I mean, this also uh, is, illustrates the, uh, the absurdity of, of this uh, criticism, and uh, be, because they considered the, these artworks offended the feelings of believer in the way they depict Christ and his modernist, this and it mean, well, you can imagine uh, his uh, uh, language of folk. 
But the, the most extraordinary thing about this kind of events uh, the, that, um, is that acts of vandalism and aggression uh, carried out by extreme religious patriotic people and groups of the extreme right, they have the blessing of the church and the silent consent of state authorities. And although everyone knows who is carrying out many of these aggressive acts, these people are not being punished. Um, well, to conclude, I want to emphasize that the culture sphere provides uh, the scholar with a window through which you can look into ongoing processes in society. And to use this window to understand what, where so the Russian society is going has become even more important today as the Putin regime has made culture a target in a political, ideological offensive. But since I'm painting such a dark picture, I want to add some uh, positive uh, words. Uh, well, first of all, that uh, a lot of interesting things are uh, going on on the Russian culture scene with regard to art and theater, film, <clears throat> but also that uh, um, that the that the, the representatives of the of the Russian culture they do not give in that easy to um, the to the signals and uh, the new state policy uh, and they um, that heads of uh, uh, cultural institutions like art museums and theatre direct directors. Uh, uh, and many other people from, from the world of culture, that they have publicly uh, stood up uh, in defending uh, those curators, uh, organizers, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, theater directors, which have been under attack uh, from uh, conservative silos. And, and these people, they are few, but they exist, and they, I would say, give the hope for the future. I stop here. Thank you. So we have time for some questions and discussion from the audience. Um, who would like to begin? Uh, there are many provocative issues raised, so this is a wonderful opportunity to explore them further. Yes, back there. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Ophelia. I'm a master's student at Crete. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have two questions today. The first one is, what is the significance of the division between the second and third categories of art that you, um, that you study? Because while the second category doesn't um, explicitly have a specific message, don't you think that the fact that it um, perhaps looks down on or uh, disparages or mocks authority makes it inherently political in the political context of um, like Russia's power vertical and the system that um, very much kind of almost glorifies um, figures of authority like you know, Putin, the strong man of Russia. Um, and my second question is, have you noticed an emergence of artists who identify themselves with the regime and are pro-establishment? Well, first, uh, with regard to the second and third category, well, I, I agree that it's not well, uh, that clear cut uh, between these categories. Um, but I, I, think it's, it's, I still think it's important to make this uh, distinction. That because, uh, and of course, there is a, there is a tradition in, in, uh, in Russia to underline that you are not political, you are not a political artist, that your art is not political. I, I would say that that is partly a heritage from the non-conformist stuff of the Soviet uh, underground, because they didn't want to uh, have any kind of politics involved. They had had enough of that with the social realism and so on. So that, that became the instinct and, and the tradition, that you should not be, uh, get involved in, in politics. But, but also, I mean, um, I would say that it is in, that it, since it's not 
they themselves, they, they do not uh, publicly, uh, openly spell out the, this, the, the, what, the political element. I mean, you, it's up to you to interpret it, that, it is, uh, that they are mocking the authorities. But you can't be sure. I mean, you had, uh, for example, uh, in the slideshow in the beginning, you had uh, this picture about uh, uh, Putin portrait as Pushkin. And Pushkin, he's our everything. And he's always with us. Uh, uh, and, and here was a portrait of Putin. Um, what, what does it mean? I mean, you can interpret it as this, they are mocking Putin. But I mean, it's not 100% uh, not, uh, sure that that is the only way to interpret it. But on the, the other hand, you know, if you take these examples that I mentioned, you can, you can interpret them only in one way, because they are outspoken political. And I would say this is the same with this group, Stolgera, they make a kind of European left wing, uh, a European left wing analysis uh, uh, of the political situation in an intellectual and artistic way. But I mean, you can, it's, it's spelled out. So I, I, I would say that, although it's not uh, well, that easily or clear cut, you, it, it's, it is of help to make this distinction, I would say. Uh, well, the second question. Um, well, I included in, in my book all um, people that were, how to say, had been at least critical towards the, the regime, to the regime uh, from, uh, the, from the right. I have included, for example, an artist, an, uh, uh, Bilja Gintov, and, and he is um, a follower of uh, Alexander Dugin and the Eurasian movement. He, he's, and he, he's a person of the extreme right. And, um, he used to belong to, to those criticizing the regime, but the more uh, the regime became in, well, in line with, uh, with uh, a more rightist agenda, uh, then uh, he, he became in support of the regime. But <clears throat> if you look at the scene of, uh, of, of, of contemporary art, they, during these years, I'm studying. I mean, the, um, those who, when I was looking for protest in, in art, dissensus in art, um, then it was, um, it was um, critical, criticism of the regime, but from, how to say, uh, liberal, uh, leftist, uh, uh, anarchist uh, um, point of view, although this was not spelled out. Uh, and, and the criticism from the right did not exist, the, and it was not true regime. But if you look at the situation today, it is different, because with with the um, with the new policy and the new cultural policy, I mean the purpose is to get an art that is well, the, the maximum uh, would be that it would really, I mean it's as it's then spelled out in these uh, guidelines that it, they should spread and, 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 and strengthen uh, these values of the ideology. But it's not that easy to get out when you follow uh, such kind of directives. But, <coughs> but the, still, they, the, 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 the state can make its effort, and it is making uh, efforts in the way appointment policy to change the direction of institute, institutions and biennial um, and festivals by the people who you have appointed uh, as the leader and, and um, the financing what money what you give what you, uh, what you give money for and they and encourage now uh, well how to say patriotic topics uh, more. I wouldn't say that this is uh, spell, uh, uh, well, that visible in art, but you can, you, you, you can find it 
and you can find it um, in um, uh, in, the, in the way they have always been supporting uh, patriotic graffiti, street art, uh, and um, there have been political uh, uh, art, political art exhibitions. But then during, I mean, I'm talking now about 2014, 2015, uh, <clears throat> political caricatures and political art in line with Putin's policy. So in in um, in that sense, it is appearing um, more of that kind. And I'm now not talking about more, um, how to say, traditional art, which might be more figurative or um, which uh, still is art, but it's not outspoken polit politically. Um, so the scene is uh, is changing. But I would say that um, the, the scene of contemporary art is still, uh, of the professional ones, are still, um, how to say, a base of uh, resistance. And you can look at the uh, Kandinsky, nominations for the Kandinsky Prize this year. Then they are those people who are on the long list, or, well, uh, mainly well, solid names from, from the contemporary art scene. So there seems to be no kind of uh, political pressure on who to nominate. So, I, but I would say that there are a lot, it's changing. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my question is in part related to the previous question and your answer, and that is within the field that you outline here as the census in contemporary Russian art. This field itself is very heterogeneous. And Mushto I mean, they are openly Marxist. Uh, this is very different from a number of many, most other examples, in fact, that you, that you offer here. So I'm wondering how you would account for that kind of internal, if you will, Rather, are political differentiation still between different types of uh, uh, approaches within that field, once again, that you're calling the census? Because sure, we can establish the distinction between the consensus, <coughs> the normative framework, cultural society, politics, and then what in different ways is, let's say, opposition. But I think only when you start <coughs> taking into account the internal differences within that field, can you also uh, uh, begin to account for, and this is my question to you really, what you can only thus begin to account for the question, what are the exact manifestations of that process of subjectivization that you are after? Because one could say that for Ancier, subjectivization is precisely insofar as what you seem to be referring to as properly political art uh, is absent. In other words, art that has this liberatory function that asks the audience to work actively with it, but without political rhetoric, necessarily. Yeah, but I would say that the, the, uh, Ranciere is not, talk, <coughs> he's not talking about <coughs> straight political art. No, exactly. <coughs> he's not, no. Uh, and he, he does not believe in an art uh, that has, has such a purpose. And he also says that you can never um, expect, you cannot, not, uh, you don't know what will be the effect. So in that sense, uh, Stodien, well, is, um, uh, I agree. I mean, Stodien is only mentioned in the book. I'm giving it a large uh, role in the presentation because they opened an exhibition in Sweden uh, well, a few days ago. Uh, but I, uh, I, uh, I agree that, um, um, they are they are more using it as part of a uh, as an instrument for a political struggle. Although they have their art language, and that makes it different from from what uh, Ron said. Um, uh, and they are, I would say that they are uh, they are exceptions in in, in in that way in Russia, and and. Um, um, and then, and but it's also interesting to see that uh, during the um, 
mass protest in, uh, in, in, two, in spring 2012. And when you had this Occupy Abai, um, then there were younger artists and the, the question was uh, coming up again, active, became active again. But in what way art could, could play a more direct role in the political struggle? And in the way that the, um, it was uh, posed, it, it, uh, it, um, it seemed as if the art that, that this um, young artist that he was suggesting well, the more of this directly. And, and everyone almost said, no, no, no. Uh, because with the bad experience from, um, from, from art being an instrument of a political organization from uh, Soviet history, so is that uh, uh, the art, it cannot not remain art uh, in, in that case. And, um, and I would say that um, now if, if, uh, uh, these young artists who were brought this question up, uh, they have not taken on uh, a path of this very direct link with politics. They are very much uh, indirect and intellectual. So in that sense, but also, I mean, the, the political situation has changed, but it, it means that since Pussy Riot is not active anymore, uh, the, the Stordier is still an, uh, more or less uh, an exception, because those who want to have a stronger political com component, they do not, um, uh, they do not, uh, uh, um, uh, how to say, get on into this direct political uh, expressions. Do you understand? I understand. Mm. Yes, go ahead. Um, I was very interested in what you said about the Novosibirsk Opera Company's production of Tannhäuser, which I had not heard about. Could you say a little more about that, uh, what, what happened there, and maybe use that as a springboard to say a little bit more about what is happening now in terms of pressure from the authorities on the performing artists of Russia, particularly theatre and opera perhaps, as being the major storytelling, maybe media, um, including what kinds of pressures we should now imagine are being placed on some of the very prominent Russian artists who perform outside Russia um, in the world of music and opera and so on. And, and second, if I can tack on a second question, uh, I apologize for my ignorance if I should know this, the directives of what I think you said were late 2014, um, are these public directives? In other words, they, uh, artistic organizations have been told this is what you should be aiming to do, or is it more of a something that is known to be going on within the Putin regime that has somehow leaked or has generally come to be known? I wonder whether you could say a bit more about those directives. No, well, um, what happened in Novosibirsk was that um, the bishop in the area that he um, he took actions and he started to <clears throat> to mobilize uh, people and uh, against uh, the, this uh, production and, <clears throat> and uh, uh, that he took uh, to court uh, but then there was this uh, uh, preliminary investigation whether the court would take it up so in the case or not and they, then it, they, the conclusion was that, you know, there is nothing criminal in this. So, but, um, um, but, they did, they, uh, but the priest and these patriotic orthodox organizations, like Narod and Sabor and others, uh, they, they well, continued to make uh, uh, an affair of this. And they continued to, to try to bring it up as a legal case. And in this uh, situation, the Minister of Culture intervened. And it's important to say that previous ministers of, of culture uh, were during the 1990s and, and 2000. They usually have uh, stayed out of the, of the, of, uh, the cultural sphere. And, uh, um, but I mean, this new one, he intervened directly. And he then fired <coughs> the, the theatre director. And, um, and, and this became a scandal, well known over the country. 
and the, well, all famous names from uh, the, the, the Russian world of theater, they stood up in uh, defending um, the, 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 the theater director and, and, uh, the, uh, and the people responsible for, for the production of the stage in it. Uh, so it also showed the polarization in, in, in Russian society. Um, well, the, the conf conflicts have continued, and, and uh, I mean, it's remarkable that, for example, this, uh, this bishop, um, he also said that, well, it was a, a production that was not in uh, uh, the tradition, and it was not fair to Wagner. Which is also well <laughs> remarkable, and and this argument that you are not um, in line with the tradition and you are not fair to the writers, uh, it's it's not as it use, usually have been uh, produced. Um, this have, have has become an argument, and uh, there have been uh, these uh, uh, investigations of uh, several plays. Um, by this, by the, like Vadamolov uh, and Serebrenikov, for example, uh, with the um, plays by, um, well, text of uh, Pushkin and Dostoevsky, and they have come to the, con to the conclusion then that they have not been uh, according to tradition. And, <clears throat> and um, you can see the scandal that now has developed around the festival, International Theatre Festival, Golden Mosque. Um, where they, um, they have um, replaced the jury and got the, the other people and, the, which, and who are uh, and the, the new policy is that one should include I mean it should not be this innovative European uh, inspired um, well, uh, direction in, in the, in the theater, theater but it should cover well much more and, um, and um, it means that it will be a more a convention, conventional, more traditional, and a more maybe a patriotic uh, um, kind of place that will be included in the in the in future. But I mean, there, there is um, a fight, a struggle going on, and there are two flanks, two camps fighting uh, on this issue. Um, well, with regard to those that are traveling abroad, uh, these groups, those groups, I don't know, it's hard to say. I mean, it, I guess it's also dependent on who is inviting and what you invite. Um, so and I think that the inviting side well, will, uh, will uh, decide all that. Um, <clears throat> well, then with regard to the directives, well, <clears throat> if you read the last version of the directives, they are not that specific. They are, of course, not telling you all to do that and that and that. Uh, no. Uh, but it's important to understand this last version, uh, to, to, uh, to read also the previous version. Because the pre first version that came from the Minister of Culture, it was quite blunt. Uh, and it caused uh, a strong reaction and criticism from some. <clears throat> and then it was the, uh, came the, the, uh, the official draft, uh, which was uh, a bit more modified. And then came the final one that was signed by, by, uh, <clears throat> by Putin. And, um, and um, there you have had an, an expert, expert, Mr. Vladimir Tolstoy, who, who, was, who, who then had influenced uh, the, the whole language and the way it was put, so it was more, much more modest document. But at the same time, as you had all these pillars that uh, had been there from the beginning, and and uh, these are in line with the with the with the new ideological political um, paradigm, I would say. It's the way of the presenting Russia as very unique. I mean, I would say that all countries are unique. Uh, so in that sense, Russia is not different. But it's also in the tradition of, uh, of authoritarian ideologies uh, of such countries to present themselves as that they are these extremely unique, which makes their experience from other countries irrelevant and also makes them 
uh, that they, they need to be sovereign, to decide everything by themselves, and not to have relations to, uh, to international law or to universal principles. And, and you can see, and if I say that, <clears throat> that uh, this agenda uh, of, of Putin nowadays is, uh, I mean, since 2012, that it is, <coughs> is um, an uh, utmost conservative one. Um, I will. I will also want to uh, um, uh, point to the dynamics uh, in the present situation, because uh, since he since he um, uh, removed the liberal flank in public debate, it means that that is only a conservative flank, and I mean, I'm not talking about conservative in the European sense, I'm talking about, uh, 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 well, I mean, this authoritarian kind of uh, conservatism. And it means that there are various kinds of groups, groupings, tendencies within this conservative one. And there is a strong dynamic in this. And, and uh, you can see, for example, how this um, hunt in the tense, polarized situation of the um, Crimea, um, the, this hunt for the domestic enemy, uh, uh, how that also is something that adds to the dynamic uh, of, uh, of the political situation and in a way well, makes the whole debate and the whole official discourse uh, when getting more and more into an authoritarian right. If that is, and, and in that context, you also have to interpret and understand the, the guidelines. But um, I also want to emphasize that it's one thing, as a, as always, there is one thing what is uh, said in directives, and it's another thing what comes out, and and uh, and. Uh, and, um, and I would say that um, the new directives are not fully implemented in cultural life, and that the cultural community well, it shows resistance. Uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, well, and that is the reason why there are scandals and conflicts I mean, in, the, in the sphere of uh, culture at the moment. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm from the UK, and I, I was, while I was listening to you, um, thinking about the differences between the role of culture and politics in Russia and in the UK. I mean, in the UK now, contemporary avant-garde art really doesn't engage with politics. The politicians really don't care at all. You know, if they look at Damien Hirst's shark in formaldehyde or Tracy Emin's unmade bed, it doesn't touch them, it doesn't engage with them at all. Where art does engage with the politicians is in the great British tradition of cartoons and satire. And this is a tradition that goes back centuries to, you know, Rowlandson and Gilray and Hogarth and Swift and so on. And th that's a very much a tradition that's alive now in UK contemporary culture. All the newspapers have major cartoonists who, who make sometimes vicious cartoons. I mean, for example, recently Tony Blair's so-called apology on the Iraq war was completely ripped to shreds by the cartoonists. You know, what my question is, is really, is, is there any of that tradition in Russia? Was, was there ever that tradition? And does any of that survive in, in the Russian press today, the, the, the tradition of cartoons and satire? Well, if I start from the second question, I mean, if you, um, it, um, well, if you first take the, the non-outspoken political uh, kind, of, uh, kind of art, and then you take the, this sort of from the Soviet underground, which were mocking authorities, then that is kind of tradition. If you look at the political caricatures, if you if you would follow have followed the, the this internet activism uh, in 2011, for example, before the elections uh, and uh, also immediately after the elections, then they were they, they were using a uh, uh, direct political language in the way that. Uh, uh, of ca caricatures and, and satire and iron and everything. 
and the most um, uh, mean and funny characters is that you, you could uh, think of in the way of, of mixing and, and cutting and uh, uh, I mean I remember for example um, one which I like quite a lot which uh, they had taken from uh, an interview with Putin on TV uh, which went on for long uh, uh, <clears throat> let's say an hour or, or two and they had cut all uh, what he said so they had only left uh, all these um, uh, sounds in between, like <clears throat> well, this kind of words. And so they, all, it was all like this. And then they had made the manipulated uh, the, the, the pictures of the audience as well. So they were looking <laughs> astonishment uh, and laughing. Uh, and together it was quite mean and it was very funny. Uh, but the, I would say that uh, it, it existed. But it's also a question of the political situation, how much is allowed. And now in the, this tightening political situation, it, you can, uh, it becomes more of a criminal act to, to, to mock that directly and with, with Putin. And, and these clear symbols. This was disseminated on the internet, basically, was it? And that is, yeah, they, yeah, that was on the they're internet. now cracking down on internet dissemination of Yeah, and that, but also that there have been added uh, new laws yes. that, that more specify that this, uh, some of this cannot be allowed. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, that means the shrinking Space, uh, so they're desperately trying to control the internet to stop yeah, political but, Yeah, but I mean, they are not con controlling the internet uh, yet, so they are not. But, but it seem, what is interesting is, uh, like as, uh, what I say with culture policy, to see the intentions, and the, the, the intentions with the inter on the internet is to get control of it, but it's not easily done. But well, the, Chinese, but the Chinese manage it. Yeah, but they don't use the, those methods that the Chinese. They have been trying to do it by creating new laws and to take it from, from, from there, although it's not a legal, uh, any kind of legalism. But with regard to your, what you said about um, the British scene, I would say that um, it also depends on who is looking. I mean, I guess that there are people in Great Britain who would, uh, uh, would consider that uh, oh, it's unmoral, it's, uh, it's uh, disgusting, it's ugly, it's, well, whatever. And there are lots of people that would say these things. And, and, um, uh, and in the same way uh, uh, in, in Russia, I would say that it's more of how to say, uh, um, a conservative approach uh, to, to this and to, to art, what you accept and what you do not accept. And it's not only Russia in this case, I would say that a more conservative uh, uh, perspective on, on this is spreading um, as a more conservative or this kind of conservative uh, views are, are spreading in Europe. I can't <coughs> tell about the US, but in but in, in Europe they are spreading, um, and they are part of, of, of the, on that uh, trend as well. <clears throat> but in, in Russia it also takes on, I mean, with this perception of the, of the enemy being outside and inside, uh, it, um, and the values which have now been defined in the way they have been defined, uh, it's, it's, it's becomes important to defend them. And then this contemporary art, all these theater plays, they are considered to be undermining traditional Russian values or patriotism or pride or painting a too black picture of society or whatever. Thank you. Time. We have time for one more? One more, one more question then. For one last question, go ahead. So looking at this beautiful picture, uh, do you think that uh, protest art is on the rise now in Russia? 
Uh, is it on the rise? Is protest art on the rise in Russia? And uh, is it any kind of indicator of whether there is demand for such art amongst the Russian public or society? <coughs> well, two questions. To start from the, the last one. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, contem contemporary art. Well, protest art. Or protest art. Yeah, yeah. The, because uh, this is protesting contemporary art. Um, but let's say wider contemporary art is not loved by everyone. I mean, it's loved by a minority in all countries, and maybe well, uh, more of a minority in Russia, which is a fairly well uh, conventional uh, society. Uh, so, so uh, the, in the way the, it did the contemporary art, Protestant contemporary art did play a role, to my mind, it was because it attracted. Well, the, uh, these groups were the creative class and the, the parts of the middle class, and those were the people who then participated in the demonstrations. And, and um, well, the, the masses, so to say, had no idea about this contemporary world. They may, this made them a, a sense in, but uh, that, that's, that's it. Uh, but still, I would say that contemporary world did play a role. Even, although it was such a small group of people, because I mean it's like this uh, stage is. Uh, I mean. um, then uh, the first question, whether it's on the rise. No, I wouldn't say that it's on the rise. Uh, it's uh, the, the same as with the protest movement. I mean, the, what has uh, official policy has has been able to to cut the protest movement and stop that wave for the coming years, we don't know for how many years, but for some years uh, we have. With, with regard to, the, the, to, to, the, to art, I mean, they have not stopped contemporary art, but they have, they have uh, minimized um, some forms of contemporary art where there are more of an open protest. But uh, still there can be a critical eye within art although it becomes more indirect. And if you look at it from an, art, or from an artistic point of view, I would say that this only makes art even more interesting. So, um, yeah. I mean, let me thank you uh, once again on behalf of all of us for this extremely interesting, enlightening talk on a subject that doesn't receive enough attention. Thank you again. Thank you.